So welcome to the fifth annual conference of the Friends of Sophia. Uh, this year it's Wisdom in Stone and you're joining us uh, at the Wells and Mendit Museum next to Glorious Wells Cathedral in Somerset. Uh, we are very, very grateful to the chapter of Wells Cathedral, uh, to the Wells um, and Mendit Museum and Christine here who's answered so many emails from me. Uh, for making today possible. Thank you, those of you who are joining us in person and those of us, those who are joining us online from far and wide. If this is your first time with the Friends of Sophia, it's actually a very simple idea. It's people united in the heart of wisdom, united in searching humbly and generously together for wisdom. We are Christian-centred, we are devoted to the figure of wisdom, Sophia in Holy Scripture, rather a forgotten figure, but such a rich figure, more will emerge about her today. I better not go, get going on her, otherwise I will be eating into Tom's time, be introducing him in a minute. Uh, we began last night with a uh, reconstruction of the medieval Easter dance in the chapel of Wells Cathedral. And today it's the conference talks and discussions. Uh, just a few housekeeping points. You've got your program. Anybody who's with us here in person, if you've not got a program, they're on the table at the back of the room. Uh, fire exits are through the main door through which you came or through here, door just to my right. Um, there are uh, bathroom facilities out the main door and then turn right. There will also be a, a coffee break at 10.40. Um, we are recording um, today's session, so it will be available on the Friends of Sophia website along with previous year's conferences uh, later on. Um, Wisdom in Stone, of course, we are looking at sacred architecture and where there'll be a rich variety of subjects on sacred ar architecture, past, present and future during the day. Just one thing on your program, it says that the meditation led by Canon Patrick in the Lady Chapel will be from 1.45 uh, to 2.15. It's actually going to be two to 2.30 now. So if you want to alter that on your program, Meditation is 2 to 2.30, which will give you a little bit longer for lunch in one of the cafes in this lovely town. Um, any other general points? No, good. I think I've covered everything on my list then. So uh, it gives me great pleasure. I'm Father Dominic White, by the way. I'm one of the co-founders with Julian McLean of the Friends of Sophia. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Tom Bree. Uh, Tom uh, lives and works here in Wells. Uh, he is an authority on medieval sacred architecture. We look at these glorious cathedrals. Um, what we often don't know, the very particular way that they were constructed and the sacred symbolism and also philosophical symbolism that is behind them. So we look forward to Tom leading us into that today as he reflects with us on the geometry and cosmology in the design of Wells Cathedral. And Tom preach, uh, teaches at the Prince's Foundation School of Traditional Arts. So <laughs> slip of the tongue there, dear me, you can tell what my profession is, can't you? And, um, and at WISE, which Tom will tell you a bit more about, also, Tom is bringing out a book on the cosmos in stone in October with wooden books. I think he'll also be saying a little bit more about that. So thank you very much, Tom, and also for the enormous work that you've been doing on the ground in the months of preparation for this conference. So over to you, Tom Breen. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dominic. Uh, could someone hit the lights? Helen, could you maybe hit the lights? Thank you. Thanks, well, Dominic, and thanks for asking me to, uh, to speak in this event. Uh, I actually heard of Dominic when uh, I gave a talk in Wales Cathedral, um, and someone was there who knows Dominic and said, oh, you must meet Father Dominic. You're talking about exactly the same things, about Sophia and uh, the ascent to wisdom. 
And so that's how we uh, ended up uh, meeting. Now for the past, goodness, it's about 12 years now, I think, I've been looking at the design of the cathedral over the road. And it started off really just as a, a slow, gradual looking at things. Because at that time, I was really teaching uh, Islamic patterns, because that's what I uh, was trained in, and that's what I uh, learned at the Prince's School of Traditional Arts, which is also where I teach now, but where I'd done my uh, MA with Professor Keith Critchlow. And so looking at cathedral geometry was something very new. Now, it's, it's developed very, very gradually, and after about seven years, which perhaps is an appropriate number, this is when the cosmic mythology began to come into the storyline. Up to that point, I just really had geometry and cosmology and some musical ratios were beginning to happen as well. But then cosmic myth came in. And this is really what I'm going to focus on primarily in this talk, um, and particularly geometry and cosmology uh, as a cosmic mythos. Okay, I'll speak closer to the microphone. Thank you. Right. Oh. Sorry, that was, I didn't know that shared my screen. You'll have to make me host, probably. Yeah. You have to make me host. Great. Okay. Right, let's begin. <coughs> so as I mentioned, cosmology and geometry are going to be a central focus in this talk but very much how they can be understood and contemplated uh, in the spiritual imagination. So I'm not talking about cosmology in the way that it's studied now, which perhaps is very, I suppose, just a description of material processes and material forms. It's cosmology as understood in the spiritual imagination as a way of contemplating the spiritual life. Now the key theme is illumination and cosmologically speaking, illumination associated with the East in the sense of the ascension of light in the East. And so with this in mind, I actually want to begin uh, by talking a little bit about the fairy tale Sleeping Beauty. Now, I'm sure you're aware of this story, and um, you're possibly aware as well that it's known as Briar Rose in uh, the Grimm's stories. Sleeping Beauty is um, uh, another ver variation of it. In Sleeping Beauty, uh, the character is known as Aurora, and she is, of course, the goddess of the dawn, or that's who Aurora is. She's the mother of the morning star as well in the Roman tradition. Now, there's something very Marian about her. Um, she lives in a palace, 
and her parents have been longing for a child, but they haven't managed to have one. And then finally, they have uh, the Sleeping Beauty, or who is going to become the Sleeping Beauty. So this is similar to the Proto-Evangelium of James storyline of the Virgin Mary and her parents. And of course, Briar Rose, this is another of these themes I'll be talking about as we go through. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, there's this wonderful uh, childhood uh, of wakefulness, I'm, I'm going to call it, and you'll sort of see why I describe it like that in a second, because what then eventually happens, <clears throat> or what happens at the beginning of her life, is that this curse is put on her, that um, she will fall asleep. And so her father does everything possible to stop this from happening, but it doesn't work out. She falls asleep, and then you have this action moving to the outside of the castle. So we've had this wonderful time in the castle, but then everyone falls asleep, uh, as it were, with the onset of adulthood. Uh, she's 15 at the time. That's usually the age that uh, is described uh, as being what she is when she falls asleep. Now, the action then goes to the outside of the castle and to someone who knows that she is in there and wants to try and reawaken her. But he can't get in the castle because it's covered over by a briar, by uh, the thorns and thistles of earthly suffering, as it were. Now, eventually, he does find his way through the thorns and thistles. They actually open up for him. Uh, the thorns and thistles had caught various other people up um, prior to him going there. They'd got caught up in, in, in the thorns of, of suffering, as it were. But he manages to find his way through and to reawaken that which had fallen asleep within him with the onset of adulthood. And so once he reawakens the inner world, she comes to life and there can then be matrimony and the inner and the outer world can return back into relationship. No, I'm afraid my picture has frozen. Asleep. It has. <laughs> it has. <laughs> I think I will, yeah. I had a, a funny experience at a talk I gave last week, last weekend, where uh, I started um, talking about something, uh, recounting something my teacher had said to me. Um, but then my mind went blank and I actually had to say to the audience, I'm sorry, my mind's gone blank. And then a few seconds later, about 30 seconds later, I remembered what it was that I was actually, uh, what I'd forgotten. And I was about to talk about the etymology of the word remember. <laughs> I'm afraid Mercury is in retrograde. It feels like it. It does feel like it. Uh-huh. Right, get rid of that. It should work if it's bottom right of the picture for me this one. Where you go right to the bottom right. Yeah, it's right, hang on a second. I'm gonna remember your bottom right. Then slide show Go to slide show. Click on slide show. No, it actually it actually froze. It's okay though, it's it's sorted now. Yeah, I've got to reshare the screen. Right, now I think we shall now have it. Thank goodness for that. Okay, she's reawoken. And she's reawoken to St. Peter's second epistle, which is, of course, an appropriate one. Now, this is one of the mentions of the morning star in the Bible. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. Yeah. 
until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now this of course is very clearly uh, the use of cosmological symbolism. It's not a, a literal description of the morning star. It's talking about an inner state as understood or as contemplated through a cosmological process. Now the morning star is really the main theme I'm going to stick to with this talk because there's a lot of symbolism in the cathedral design uh, concerning the morning star and also the evening star. So I'm talking about, of course, the planet Venus. There are various different figures um, who are associated with the morning star in Christianity. And of course, the morning star is a symbol that's used in various different traditions. But within Christianity specifically, uh, one of them is the Virgin Mary, known as Stella Matutina, morning star. <clears throat> John the Baptist is also known as morning star. And I'll describe both of these um, shortly once I've given you the whole list. Now, the other two are the risen Christ, and finally, uh, Lucifer, the fallen angel. Now, the story of the risen Christ and Lucifer, the fallen angel, are completely interconnected. You could say they're part of the same process, two different stages of the same process. Now, to understand this symbolism, we first of all need to go into this idea of the morning star and the evening star. Now, what you're looking at here is actually the morning star. It's a photo I took out of my bedroom window when I uh, opened the curtain and uh, there she was. So we always see Venus around sunrise or around sunset. Um, because if you think about it, when you're looking at Venus, you're looking at a planet that's going around the sun. So you can almost sort of encompass the whole of its orbital circle. So Venus is always in close proximity to the sun. And this is really part of how she's very much associated with um, the emergence and the recession of light. Once the sun is above the horizon, the sun bleaches out the sky, and so we can't see any of the stars anymore. So it's just before sunrise that we can see Venus as the morning star, and just after sunset that we can see her as the evening star. And it happens at different times in the year. Now, this is what I'll describe with this um, simple cosmological diagram. Now, you need to imagine that you're on Earth, which is at the very bottom, and that outer circle is Earth's orbital circle. The next circle in is Venus's orbital circle, and that's where the numbers uh, are written. The next circle in from there is Mercury, which I won't be talking about, and the circle in the middle is, is the Sun. Now, what you need to imagine is that Venus is moving around the circle um, whereas we're still, I suppose you could say. So we're fixed at the bottom there. And then Venus will slowly move around the circle. And when Venus moves in front of the sun, she becomes invisible. <coughs> and that takes eight days. And then when Venus appears uh, on the right side, when Venus appears here on the right side, then that is when she's the morning star. Now, Earth is turning from our view, turning anti-clockwise. So as the face of Earth turns in this direction, it sees this stretch of orbital circle here, and that's the morning star, and then it turns around and sees the sun. Now, once Venus passes behind the sun, that takes around 50 days, and that's the one at the top, and then she appears again as the evening star. So she's beyond the sun, as it were. The view comes around like this, so you see the sun and then see the evening star um, at that point in the cycle. So there are these two distinct movements of Venus rising in the east just before the sunrise or setting in the west just after sunset. So there is this, this direct connection with the emergence and the recession of light. Now, in various traditions, you find um, the morning and the evening star are sometimes two different characters, though connected. Um, so uh, Shahar and Shalim are the Canaanite morning star and evening star. And one of the etymological theories of the name Jerusalem is that it's Yeru Shalim, uh, established by the evening star. This is one of the, the um, well, uh, theories of the ancient world. It's 
that, and I think there's something to it as well. There's various reasons I can't go into now, but it makes sense. So if we're thinking about this symbolically, the morning star rises and ascends into heaven, whereas the evening star sets and symbolically speaking, falls down into the earth or perhaps goes down into the earth. And this is something you find in various different traditions, even in the Aztec tradition, they have uh, Quetzalcoatl who goes down into the underworld, rises up into heaven. It's very interesting sort of um, uh, use of symbolism in various different parts of the world. Now this um, storyline is very clearly there with the Sumerian and Babylonian Venus. Uh, the Sumerian Venus is Inanna and then Ishtar is um, the Babylonian. Now this is actually the depiction of Ishtar, what you're looking at here, this eight pointed star and we'll come to an eight pointed star shortly. Oh, I am a geometer after all. Now the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist, they're both associated just with the morning star and it's associated with the idea that they precede Christ. So Christ is the sun that illuminates the world through his rising. And the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist are both associated with uh, preceding him. And so that's why they're associated with the morning star. Now the risen Christ and Lucifer the fallen angel are both morning star and evening star. Both of them descend, both of them ascend. But the key thing is that one happens first, the other happens afterwards, and they also do the opposite movement. And that's what we'll look into next. Now, Lucifer's story, it develops in the Middle Ages. It's taken from uh, a quote from Isaiah. Isaiah is actually talking about a character who is uh, known as the King of Babylon. So he's not talking about um, a fallen angel called Lucifer. That's a, a later development that goes with Isaiah's words. Now, having said that, bearing in mind that Babylon symbolizes, I suppose you could say, the corruption of the earthly world where the soul is in exile from its true state in the promised land. And so in that sense, you could say that Lucifer, the fallen angel, is in a certain sense the king of Babylon. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Now Sheol is the deathly underworld in the Hebrew tradition. And this is where Lucifer falls to, as you can see. But it's also where Christ goes with the harrowing of hell. Now, something that's important to understand geometrically about this is that with the old idea of the planetary spheres, Earth is the sphere that's at the center. And then you gradually have more and more spheres of the planets going out and out until you get to the stars. And then you get to the first moved sphere. And then beyond that, you have the eternal realm. So Earth, in this sense, is as far as you can get from the divine realm. And so hence the need for the ascent of the soul through the planetary spheres. But there is, of course, one place that's even further from the divine realm than the surface of planet Earth, where we are, and that's the center of planet Earth. And so this is the position of Sheol, the center of the Earth, the very central point. Now, of course, we could talk about this as being, I suppose you could say, the egoic center. Or when we uh, are in our ego, then that is the center that we're focused on. But the center, truly speaking, is the one out there, the divine realm. Now you can probably see in this image here, at the very center, there's this mouth of death swallowing people. I don't know if you can make that out, but that's what's being depicted there. And I'll show another example of that shortly. Uh, 
So way to understand Lucifer is that his ascent, because he first rises as the morning star, and of course Lucifer is the Roman name for the morning star, the Roman name for the planet Venus. But his ascent is a hubristic one. Um, he's trying to raise his ego to equality with God. And so the inevitable outcome of that is for him uh, to have a humiliating fall into the underworld. There, there, there's a need to learn some humility because there's too much, too much hubris. There's a particular figure who's very well known at the moment, who I think you'll probably be aware of him. He said that he's uh, uh, more, more humble than you could ever know. And there's something particularly interestingly uh, Luciferian about this particular way of seeing things uh, in, in the sense of being very puffed up and wanting to be in power and wanting to be the best. Now, Christ's storyline is the opposite, or you could say it's the counteraction. So whereas Lucifer's storyline happens first, uh, Lucifer's storyline is actually associated with being before Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden as well. You could say it's the fall of the mind rather than the fall of the senses. So the counteraction of Lucifer is Christ's story. And of course, what he does is the same movements, but in the opposite direction. Now, Christ goes down to liberate all that is fallen and dead within the human soul so that it can be brought up into the light. And here's another image of this, this mouth of death, the death of the underworld of Sheol. And this was part of what we did in the dance last night, so in the third movement of the dance, the, the raising up. In fact, that uh, icon that Dominic mentioned of Christ pulling uh, Adam and Eve out from the ground, it, it reminds me of the when St. Paul talked about neither Greek nor Jew, neither male nor female, because of being one in Jesus Christ. So you have this movement up towards the one from duality, from division, up to the one. Now, I'm very interested in this word harrow and talking about the harrowing of hell, because, of course, a harrow is a farming tool, which you can see in the image on the right there. And it's something that breaks up the large clods of earth so that the seeds can actually grow and not become choked. So the seed can grow and rise up in its greenness to the divine light of the sun. Now, in any spiritual path, there, of course, needs to be this breaking up of the large clods of ego and pride before there can be any movement uh, beyond and then upwards. And so the harrowing of the soul, which obviously can be quite a, a harrowing experience, but a, a necessary one. So with Christ, he descends first, but it could be described as a kenotic descent. He enters himself out, and this then leads to exaltation, going to the very lowest point and then being exalted to the very highest point. So Lucifer first rises and then falls, whereas Christ descends, but when he rises, he rises as the one morning star who never sets. And that's in the exaltet, which uh, Dominic also mentioned last night. So it's having left the cycle of rising, falling, rising, falling. Now, if there's a moral to the story, it must be this. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Or perhaps you could say the first shall be last and the last shall be first. But these two um, characterizations, you could say, Lucifer, the fallen angel, Christ, harrowing of hell, and then rising, you could say that they're two different stages of the one process that we have to go through. Right, the next aspect of Venus that I want to talk about is one that isn't really talked about very much other than by a few people like me, geometry geeks, people who are into this sort of stuff, whereas it was very clearly around in the medieval world and in the ancient world. <clears throat> and it's the fact that planet Venus actually plots out various geometric forms in relation to its movements with planet Earth. Now, it may sound fantastical, but when we look at the natural world around us, we have geometry in everything that grows. So why would geometry suddenly stop uh, working once you leave the surface of planet Earth? And if we think about what's going on, it's lots of spheres moving in circles around one another. And so, of course, there is geometry very clearly. 
Now, this relationship of Earth and Venus occurs because the length of time with the orbital period of Earth and the orbital period of Venus um, is very close to an approximate, it's an approximation of the golden ratio. And the golden ratio is a mathematical ratio that naturally brings forth five-fold symmetry if it presents itself in a circle. Now, what you're looking at, this is well, what generally we call the Venus pentagram. It's from a, a geocentric perspective as you're looking at it here. So you need to imagine that you're floating above planet Earth as Earth goes around the sun, and the white curved lines forming the five-fold pattern, that is how uh, Venus moves in relation to Earth over an eight-year cycle. And those who were at the dance last night when I was going on about 13 and eight, because there was 13 of us on one side of the chapel and eight on the other, just by chance. Um, uh, and this is part of the Venus numbers because um, eight Earth years is the same as 13 Venus years, virtually identical. Now, this image that you're looking at here is from a book called The Little Book of Coincidences, which is by a friend of mine called John Martineau. He's the one who's publishing my book, in fact. Um, well worth getting. It's a very small book. He publishes books called The Wooden Books, uh, just small, um, interesting introductions to various subjects. Now, of course, you'll be aware of the association of the rose with planet Venus. And the rose, of course, the traditional depiction of the rose, the wild rose, is fivefold, as are most flowers, generally. And so you can see with this fivefold movement that Venus is the rose of the heavens. Now, there is also actually a Venus octogram as well. And here's another image from John's book the one on the right. Um, and I'll depict both of these. I have got a film that could be watched, but it's a bit difficult to show on Zoom. So it's called um, The Pentagram Dance of Earth and Venus. And it's on YouTube. It can be, you can look that up and actually see people walking the planetary movements to some music. But what I'll show you here is um, a visual depiction uh, of it instead. So these two different stars are plotted out, both from a geocentric perspective. So you don't need satellites and modern technology to know them. You can know them uh, at any point in history. But they also happen heliocentrically too, and that's the way that I'll show you them in these diagrams. Now, if we begin with Earth and Venus at the top, uh, forming a conjunction, so a straight line between Earth, Venus, and the Sun, you need to imagine Venus is moving faster, and so there'll be times when Venus uh, catches up with Earth and passes Earth by, and this creates another conjunction. So it's at these conjunction points that create the fivefold symmetry. And the fivefold symmetry happens specifically um, in the, the order that you would draw a pentagram star. So when they begin like that, they conjunct again at this point. So we can draw a line to where Venus now is, then again, and then again. And then finally back after eight years, back up to here. So it takes 1.6 years, 584 days. That's what's known as the synodic period. The image I showed you earlier of the, the circles with the numbers written on them as morning star, evening star, that's one synodic period. So that's the amount of time between one conjunction and another. So we have this five-fold star that's produced over an eight-year cycle. Now here's how the octogram works. Because it's an eight-year cycle, obviously one point of the eight-pointed star is going to appear every year. Now, what you need to imagine is that Earth being up here, Earth will go around and return back to the starting point, which obviously is a year, and will then mark where Venus is at that point. So Earth has returned back to the starting point, having gone around the orbital circle. Venus is now here. Venus has actually done this, gone around once and then around again to here. Now, if we keep on following that, this is not a year later, then another year later, and so on. And so we have the Venus octogram, five and eight. Now, if you know Fibonacci numbers, I haven't got time to go into them, but five and eight are consecutive Fibonacci numbers. And the next one after eight is 13, which is the amount of years in the Venus cycle. So this is based on something called Fibonacci numbers, which are associated with the golden ratio. Sorry, I haven't got time to go into more detail with them, but you can look them up, there's lots about them. So eight-pointed star, this is the star of um, Babylonian Venus. So clearly I would say the Babylonians were aware of this particular phenomenon. 
the Babylonians were aware of much more complex stuff than this as well. I mean, all you need to do is just see where Venus is on the same day every year. So this is comparatively straightforward. And so to this wonderful cathedral, which uh, you can see for real out there rather than in a, a darkened room on a screen. Now, I can't explain why, but there seems to be an immense amount of cosmological symbolism in this cathedral compared to most other of the cathedrals in the country. Um, I don't know why. Adelard of Bath, who was very important with the study of cosmology, geometry, he was local. So this may have been one of the design influences, but it has um, a very beautiful cosmic mythos to it as well. So it's not just technically understandable geometry. It is technically understandable geometry, but it very clearly plots out these storylines that I've been talking about up to now. So here's the ground plan. Now the general geometric coordinates I'm gonna point out are these ones here. Now if you look up to the east end where the star is, this is the chapel that we danced in last night. So the surrounds of the chapel are like so. So as you can see, it's an elongated shape. Now I mentioned last night how the east end of the chapel is pentagonal. So three of the edges of the pentagon mark uh, the east end of the building. Now if we turn that into a full pentagram, then we can see that the axes of the pentagram, with these dotted lines here, they naturally give us the central axes of the whole building, the side aisles, and the transept chapels. And the whole thing can be numerically demonstrated. It's not just something that I've drawn on a ground plan and assumed it must be there. It's all measured up and it's very correct. But what I'm gonna do, because of course, as you can see, this pentagon doesn't cover the whole of the Lady Chapel. There's this bit down here too. Now imagine that there's a circle around this pentagram here on the left, and there's the center of it, obviously. Now imagine if you go to the bottom corner of the pentagon there, that's where I'm gonna draw another circle, which is the same size of circle that would go around this pentagram star. So here we are, so the bottom corner of that pentagon is gonna be the center for this circle here. Now, if you look up in the top right-hand corner of the screen, I'm gonna put in the octagram star of Ishtar um, in that particular orientation that you're looking at it. So in it goes. And now if you look back up at that blue star on the top right-hand corner, I'll reduce it back just to the octagon at the center of the star. And you can see it very clearly gives the rest of the chapel. So the chapel is actually part pentagon and part octagon. And these are of course the two shapes plotted out by the planet Venus. And it's in the east of the building where the morning star rises. And it's a lady chapel. So of course we have this association with the Virgin Mary as the Stella Matutina. There's a tradition that talks about the Virgin Mary as being the first to receive uh, the light of the sun. And this is associated with her being the Eastern door of Solomon's temple in uh, Ezekiel's description of the temple, the temple doorway that's shut. So she's the first to receive the rays of the sun. Now, for those of you who entered the dance last night, here is this wonderful chapel. Uh, we danced around the octogram star in the middle, which of course is very appropriate. 13 on that side, eight on the other eventually. Now let's look at the Virgin Mary as the Stella Matutina, the morning star, uh, and also thornless rose. And this is associated with Eden. Roses grew in Eden without any thorns. And then with the fall of humankind, that's when the rose began to grow thorns. So you can begin to see the story of Sleeping Beauty again, very clearly. It's the thorns that grow around the castle that make it impregnable. It's not possible to get back into the castle. Uh, we've left it, but we can't find our way back in until we rise above the thorns and thistles of earthly suffering. The rosebush actually opens of its own accord because the prince who goes in is ready. He's reached the stage where he can go in and reawaken that which had fallen asleep within him with the onset of adulthood. Uh, the pricking of her finger and the bleeding is sometimes associated with menstruation and the onset of adulthood. Now, so the rose, we then go to the rosary, which of course is very clearly connected. Uh, the rosary beads are laid out with fivefold symmetry. So if we put a rose there, then obviously the sepals of the rose 
um, match up with the five mystery beads. And then you have decades of beads in between, sets of 10. Now, talking of sets of 10, these windows in the Lady Chapel, there's five of these tracery panels where you have this triangular arrangement, which is the same shape as what's known as the Pythagorean Tetractes. Now, the Tetractes was really the key form for the Pythagoreans, and it was an image of the number 10. One plus two plus three plus four. And so you could say it's the descent of the one into the many, down to the, the fourfoldness of the material world. That, that's one of the symbolic dimensions to it. Now, bearing in mind that there are five of these Tetractes windows, so that's five times 10, then you inevitably get the five decades of the rosary beads. So you see there's the, one, the main one up there, and then there's two on each side. So you don't actually need your rosary beads. You can just count by the windows, look at the windows, and you can keep up with, uh, with your prayer cycle. Now, of course, we need to remember that the rose is associated with love, but of course, this would be divine love. Um, Aphrodite Urania, in terms of Plato's symposium, where he talks about these two aspects of Aphrodite. Aphrodite Urania, you could say, is rather like the morning star rising up, and Aphrodite Pandemos is the evening star falling down into the earth. Now, my favorite bit of all of this is that the rosary beads are the same shape as the planetary glyph symbol of Venus uh, in alchemy. And there's nothing remotely sort of controversial about the medieval church taking an interest in this. The medieval church were into astrology. The only part of astrology they didn't like was fortune telling because it took away free will or it suggested that everything is preordained so you don't need to make an effort. But in every other way, all the other aspects of astrology were part of what was in the medieval church. So at the far east of the cathedral, we have the morning star rising. Now, this is also associated, of course, with resurrection. And I'll talk about that in a second, because Christ is also the bright morning star. But before we do that, let's go down to the earth. So this is the nave where we enter into the cathedral. This is the beginning of the journey. Now, there is uh, an association of Hades with the west very often. So whereas the light comes from the east, the west can be associated with Hades and with earth more generally. Now, if we look at um, the actual dimensions of uh, the nave here in the cathedral, and this is, again, it's, it's pretty much unique to Wales. I found one other place that may have it, but this is a particular type of rectangle that um, has, well, the diagonal dotted lines that you can see in the rectangle, they run at an angle of 23.4 degrees. Now that's because this rectangle is 13 by 30. So that's the specific, we have to actually multiply those numbers by five to get the footage of the nave. But what this means is that you have the axial tilt of Earth, because Earth is tilted by 23.4 degrees. So what this means is that this circle that you have going around the red rectangle, if we see it as an image of Earth, then the north and the south walls are the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. So we begin our journey in the earthly world, but the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, of course, are also to do with the solstices. So the Tropic of Cancer is the first day of Cancer. That's when the sun is closest to the um, northern part of the planet, the Tropic of Cancer. And then the Tropic of Capricorn is the middle of winter. And so you have this fluctuation side by side in the cathedral between the light and the dark. But of course, where we want to be is the middle path, which is the equinoctial path, which of course is where Easter is calculated from. Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So the middle path of the cathedral, you could say is the Paschal path, which passes in between this fluctuation of light and dark. Now the next place uh, beyond the earthly nave is the choir, and that's the same shape and size as the ground plan of the Temple of Solomon. So you could say this is the central place on earth. This is where the ascent uh, will begin from. And there are actually two uh, ascents, interestingly, and they correspond symbolically to Dante's journey, his two ascents. First, the ascent 
of the mountain of purgatory to Eden, which really is going eastwards because the Lady Chapel is also Eden, where the thornless rose resides, Eden in the far east of the world map. But there's also an ascent northwards up to the chapter house, and that's the ascent through the heavens towards the celestial north pole, the Stella Maris, again, another uh, description of the Virgin Mary. That's the central pivot of the eighth heaven, the celestial north pole. But I'm not gonna talk about that one in this talk. That's, that's a different talk. This is the solar talk. Now, another thing to point out, are you see these two purple rectangles here, the chapels that are at the east ends of the side aisles. Now the side aisles are the solstitial pathways, you could say. The two chapels here are dedicated to solstitial saints in the sense that their feast day is associated with the solstice. Um, John the Baptist has long been talked about as Midsummer's Day. Um, June the 24th was actually the summer solstice in the Roman calendar. It's now the 21st or the 22nd. Um, <clears throat> but the original summer solstice was St. John's feast day. And that's why St. John's feast day was there because Christ was associated with being born at the winter solstice and John the Baptist at the summer solstice and they were both conceived at the equinoxes. So this is a very early idea. It's, it's associated with John Chrysostom, I think. It's not known if he definitely said it, but that's, that's the traditional attribution. So there is this, this cosmic association with uh, the conception and the birth, which of course has this nine month gap between the equinox and the solstice. So John the Baptist is one of these chapels and he would be the Midsummer Chapel. Is that the one on the it's the one on the right as you're going up. So it's on the south side. There's an interesting inversion in terms of light, because in a certain sense, you would say that the summer solstice would be on the north side, because that's where the sun rises uh, at the summer solstice. But traditionally, you also have the south side of the cathedral as being the light side. So there seems to be this sort of inversion where they're both representing both. But the other chapel on the north side, that's um, St. Stephen. Now, Stephen is associated with the winter solstice. Um, through his patronage of horses. This is a non-biblical thing, and it's, it seems to be a Christianization of the really ancient uh, association of the horse with the winter solstice. So when horses um, are cut, that's like a, an old medieval tradition, that seems to be a leftover of um, a really, really very widespread practice of horse sacrifice at the winter solstice in the ancient world, going all the way through from Europe, all the way through to India. Uh, it was still happening in the Baltic regions, I think, when Wales Cathedral was being built. Oh, right. As you go to the end of the side aisles, then they're the chapels you get to straight away. So, yeah, they're not the ones that are off at the side. So, St. Stephen's Chapel has currently got lovely blue fabric uh, around it. <clears throat> so, you have these solstitial pathways, but they both lead to death because, of course, the other thing about John. And Stephen is that they're the last martyr before the Passion and the first martyr after the Passion. So there's also this biblical Paschal aspect to it, as well as the cosmological aspect. But whereas they died, if you take the middle path, which leads into the Lady Chapel, then there's going beyond death and into resurrection with the rising of the bright morning star. So the middle path is where we need to be. Now, the middle path, you could say, is eternal spring, uh, Persephone. In the story of Persephone, she's in eternal spring. She's in this ideal state, rather like Eden. But then she's abducted by, by Hades and she has to go down into the underworld. And as time goes on, the resolution is that she can spend some of the time above the ground, some of the time below the ground. So she's in that fluctuation between light and dark, rather than on the middle path where she was before she was abducted. Now, this also comes into John Milton's Paradise Lost. He says that before the fall, Earth didn't have the 23.4 degree angle, but the, the equator of Earth was level with the sun, which would mean there was an eternal equinox, and he calls that eternal spring and Eden. So the Edenic path, which leads to Eden in the east, is again the middle part of the cathedral. Absolutely. Um, I've got a thing in the book, actually, where I've quoted someone from just uh, from the main world religions talking about the middle path. So there's um, like Philolaus, the first Pythagorean, he says that everything, the whole cosmos is formed of an interplay between the bounded and the unbounded. Mm -hmm. And uh, Maimonides, there's a good quote by him as well. So yeah, that's, uh, there's a whole section about the middle path. Of that. that's, uh, that's part four. Uh, that's the section about initiation. Because initiation is surely finding the middle way. So, so solstitial 
and equinoctial or paschal. And as I said, Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So the, the paschal, the, the biblical and the cosmological are completely interconnected. Now here's a diagram of Dante's journey, because of course Dante does the same journey as Christ or a similar journey in the sense of first going down into the underworld. He begins from Jerusalem, which is at the bottom of the diagram, and then he descends into hell, gradually going lower and lower until he reaches the central point. And the central point of earth is where Lucifer is. He finds Lucifer uh, in this freezing cold place. It's not hot, it's not the fire of hell, it's frozenness. There is no love whatsoever. It's just pure death. Now he passes the center of gravity at the center of the earth and he actually describes this. And then he starts to ascend. So as he comes out of the center of the earth, he begins to ascend again. And then he gets to the mountain of purgatory and then up through the planetary spheres. Now this idea of going through the earth from one side to the other also appears to be in the cathedral design. Here's Botticelli's image of the descent. So you can see earth at the top where the green is, gradually descending down the funnel, more and more constricted until he reaches the center of the earth. Now, the only correlation I'm making here is with planet Earth. So the rest of what's up there, the mountain of purgatory and the planetary spheres, I'm not correlating with the diagram of the cathedral. But just looking at Earth at the bottom and this idea of going through the Earth, this is essentially what we're doing when we go through the nave of planet Earth. Now, the thing to be aware of is that we have to actually go to the center of the Earth here. And on this pillar, there's a very interesting character who we need to actually face before we can go any further and begin to ascend. Now here he is, this is Lucifer. Now you can tell this is Lucifer because he has uh, an eye-shaped brow or eye-shaped hole rather in the brow of his crown. And this is part of the description that you find in the Grail storylines uh, of the 1200s, which is when this was built. Now you could say that this is, I suppose in Christian terms, it might be described as the eye of providence. Um, Boethius' description of the Eye of Providence is really very similar to the description of the third eye in uh, the Indian tradition. And so it's, you could say it's his spiritual vision, and this is what he loses when he loses his emerald. He loses his spiritual vision when he falls. Now you see he has animal ears and a, a long goatee beard, and he has a, a serpentine scaly crown. So these are all animal features in the sense of that unrefined part of us that needs to raise itself up to remember its true self, uh, to reawaken that which has fallen asleep within it, which had caused it to, to leave the castle. And directly next to him is an image of the war in heaven, I would say. So you have the dragon being fought. So this is showing, this is how Lucifer got here, to the center of the nave in the cathedral. Sorry, I'll have to read that out because it's a bit obscured by the... Is there a way of getting rid of that? Right, so this is that description from the book of Revelation that describes the old serpent uh, falling. So Lucifer is a serpent and a dragon, and he falls. I'm afraid I don't know it off my heart, so I can't uh, recount that one, I'm afraid. Now the description also includes these angels that fell with him and on the immediate opposite side of the pillar from where Lucifer is, there appear to be a couple of uh, equally uh, unhappy looking uh, animal eared beings who have fallen with Lucifer. Now while we're on this subject of descending into the underworld and the nave being an example of this, um, I want to talk about labyrinths, because of course labyrinths in French cathedrals, they're around the centres of the naves in which you find them. Now, every single version of this type of labyrinth, this is the one at Chartres, I'm sure you're aware, uh, there's various different versions of this particular type of labyrinth. Every single one of them that I've ever seen always has an association with the Minotaur storyline. So even though it's Christian, they have this older storyline. This is very 12th century. They're, they're very interested in the ancient world. There isn't this... Puritanism that says that you mustn't go near anything that isn't biblical. So I would say that this storyline is understood as an analogue of Christ's descent into the underworld, or in another sense, the descent that perhaps we all need to do, because the nave is, of course, the place of the people. Uh, nave relates to the idea of, of ship and, and the journey as well. 
Now, this uh, one at Chartres is said to have had a metal plate at the center of it that um, shows a, a depiction of uh, Theseus and the Minotaur. And this is really from the Roman tradition. On Roman labyrinths, you always have this image of the Minotaur. So we have to go down into the underworld and to face this half animal, half human aspect of the soul. Uh, the Minotaur actually came into existence as a result of lust and pride. Uh, King Minos was given a white bull to sacrifice to Poseidon. Uh, Poseidon was the one who gave him the white bull, but he didn't want to, he liked the look of it. So he put it to one side and got one of his own bulls. And this led to Poseidon's great fury and uh, he went to Venus and organized uh, for Pasiphae, the uh, queen Pasiphae, the wife of King Minos, to fall in lust with the bull. And so then the product of that lust is the Minotaur, who is half human and half bull. So we have to go down into the underworld and meet this aspect of the soul so that it can be raised. Or vanquished, I suppose, is the, what happens in the Minotaur storyline. Now, Chartres on the left, Amia on the right, uh, that, that's an octagonal version of the labyrinth, Amia, um, same type of labyrinth. It's described as the House of Daedalus in a medieval document. So that one also has that association. This one here is on the, pier, it's on the pillar of the portico outside St. Martin's Cathedral in Lucca. And the inscription you can see on the right there is um, recounting the story of the Minotaur. <clears throat> oh, in fact, of course, here it is here. This is the labyrinth built by Daedalus of Crete. All who entered therein were lost, save Theseus, thanks to Ariadne's thread. So Ariadne is the guide through the underworld as well. That's, I can't go any more into that. But, uh... Now this is a painting from 1500. This is the Chartres labyrinth pulled up into the third dimension. So it has walls. And at the center, you see a chivalric knight. And this is really another, this is something I go into in the book about how chivalry um, in medieval Christianity at the time of the Crusades, very clearly is, well, it's similar to what you have in Islam, where you have the practical war, but you also have the holy inner war, which is known as the greater jihad. That's the more difficult one, the war that takes place within the soul. So in this sense, this uh, image of Theseus, he's gone to the center of his labyrinthine soul to find that which is bringing him down so that he can vanquish it, face it, and deal with it. <clears throat> so another version of the Chartres labyrinth with the uh, the Minotaur storyline. Now this is my favorite one. This is the Mapamundi at Hereford Cathedral, just down the road. This is the Mediterranean. And in the middle of the Mediterranean is the island of Crete, where of course the Minotaur storyline takes place. And there's the Chartres labyrinth on there. So very clearly there is this correlation of this medieval Christian style of labyrinth with the Minotaur storyline. And again, it's not a controversial thing. If you're a very narrow puritanical perspective, you don't like anything that isn't biblical, then obviously you're going to have trouble with it, but that's not the way it was in the 12th century. But is that actually there in Crete? Oh, no, no, not actually in Crete. No, but this is the depiction of Crete. And so Crete is associated with, because you know the, the palace, you know the palace of Nossos that was looked upon as being like a labyrinth. So the story of the Minotaur takes place in Crete. Well, and really called that, I don't know the cause of that. Why? Oh, oh, right, okay, uh -huh, okay. Oh, perhaps you need to walk the labyrinth. So. What's the labyrinth? Well, I think the Palace of Nossos was looked upon as being like looking like a labyrinth. But obviously these storylines, they're perennial, so it's not just made up according to a building, but um, I suppose the, the story is seen within the building. Now, just a few more things to say. Uh, the evening star falls, the morning star rises, and this is there with the serpentine symbolism in Christianity as well. So the serpent descends into the underworld, and that, of course, is Lucifer falling, or uh, as a, the description of the war in heaven. Um, but then Christ is the ascending serpent through his resurrection. Uh, Christ um, sheds his skin, as it were, and is reborn anew through resurrection. And this is the description um, uh, in the Bible of Christ as the serpent. And as, the, as, as Moses was lifted up, as Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now with serpentine forms, within orthodoxy, sometimes the crozier looks like this. It has these two serpents looking rather like a, a caduceus, 
with the cross in the middle. And of course, this is what crozier means. Crozier is essentially the Anglo-Saxon form of the word crucifer. So with a, with a crozier, we have this, um, I suppose, image of an ascending serpent. And so the bishop, in this sense, is the human representative of that state. And there's a fascinating crozier here, which belonged to one of the bishops who uh, built the cathedral. Um, there's a local dragon legend about him. He's called Bishop Jocelyn. And in his crozier, you see that there's both serpent storylines. There's St. Michael uh, slaying the dragon, uh, as described in the war in heaven in Revelation. But the whole thing is encompassed by the ascending serpent. And I'm sure that the shepherd's crook form of a crozier probably has that level of meaning as well, as well as being a pastoral staff. I suspect it's probably both at the same time. Now again, sorry that band at the top is obscuring things. I want to finish off just by very briefly mentioning the symbolism of circle and square. The circle is heaven, the square is earth. In fact, I think this came up last night when we were doing the dance. So the squaring of the circle, it's one of these terms you may have heard of. It, it's in a sort of non-spiritual way, it's used to mean how are we going to resolve this problem? How are we going to bring this ideal theory into earthly practice, as it were? And this is really an alchemical idea of how are we going to harmonize heaven and earth? How are we going to bring the heavenly influence down to earth? Now, squareness is what you find in many religious buildings. And you can see within a cathedral, obviously, it's just made up of lots of squares and rectangles. But the high points of the cathedral, so for instance, in French cathedrals up at the east ends, they're circular. And here at Wells, the two extremities of the cathedral, you could say the furthest east and the furthest north, they're the only parts of the cathedral that contain geometry that's derived from a circle. So pentagon, octagon, and the octagonal chapter house on the north side. So we have the circle of heaven, which is reached through passing through the square of earth. And of course the Temple of Solomon is, we could say the central place on earth. And the four canons traditionally, the four canons uh, sit in the four quarters of the choir. So you have the presenter in Northwest, the Dean sits here, and the Chancellor sits here, and the Treasurer sits here. So they're at the four corners of the earth, bringing the ministry uh, of the diocese to the earth. Right, now to finish off, I want to talk about the symbolism of circle and square in relation to the coronation chair. And this will hopefully lead us on to the next talk by Margaret Barker, because she's going to talk about the Cosmati pavement that this coronation chair sits on. Now, if you think about what happens in the coronation, you have the stone of destiny, which is the cuboid stone sitting below the chair, and you have the circular crown that goes on the head of the monarch. So you have the circle above and the cuboid down below. Now, therefore, the body of the monarch is the ladder that joins these two worlds. And so we have this incarnative, I suppose, image of the human microcosm. So every time there's a coronation, there's a reminder for all of us of the true self that we need to try and reawaken to. Here's the pavement that it happens on, which Margaret's going to give us a talk about shortly. Now, here's the book plug. There has to be a book plug. <laughs> How could there not be one? Here's the book, and here's the information. Um, you can either come to me, I can put your name on a list, or you can write to this email address, the cosmosinstone at gmail. Dot com. Um, there's lots more in the book. That's just the solar morning star bit. There's a whole lunar bit as well, which is the north side. Thanks for listening. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. All right, we are. Um, get tile oh speaker sorry good tom thank you very much indeed that was magnificent um i just wish we had time for more we're coming up close to coffee break uh, but there is five minutes if anybody has any questions or comments for Tom. Should we open the, the blinds? Good the idea. Blinds? Oh, yeah. Any comments? Is that 
So those on Zoom, if you would like to raise your hand physically or put the... I can see there are some chats. Uh, there are some chats coming in, are they? Thank you very much. Right, let's have a look at the chats. Come on. Uh-huh. All right, I think that was about just about the little techie issues we had earlier. But uh, anybody got any questions or comments? Yes, Julian. Not so much about Knossos, but in the chapter about, it's called um, The Morning Star, both the Christ and Fallen Angels. In that, I talk about Robin's uh, after having talked about, about Lucifer and the Angels. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Lucifer and the Angels. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah. yeah, I just I point it out as um, I suppose what I point out is how Dante, for instance, uh, was very interested in all sorts of characters outside of Christianity, but he used them as uh, I suppose with analogy according to a Christian understanding of things. So there was quite an open view, a very educated view at that sort of time, 12th, 13th century. And that's one of the examples. And it clearly corresponds, I would say, to the harrowing of hell, because there is this you know, not that it's a direct example of Christ, but in the sense of us trying to follow the same path, there is this need to go down and to meet that which would weigh us down, as it were. So St. Michael can, you know, so, so the scales become balanced rather than out of kilter because we're too heavy. Mm -hmm. Just trying to admit somebody. Uh, Caroline. Hello, yes, thank you very much. Um, I understand that one of the net terms for the great lady is Kubernetes, the one who guides the helmsman of the ship. And I did wonder if the nave is the journey and the nave is the keel of the ship, is our guide from the one end of the nave to the other, our lady herself. That's really interesting, and I'm sure. I mean, that makes so much sense um, because it is, as you say, it, it is uh, um, at the very east of the cathedral. So that, that is the one that leads the way. And this is um, very much an English thing, like the Lady Chapels at the east ends of cathedrals. It, it's particularly what you find in this country. Um, thanks for that. That's really useful. Uh, it, perhaps could you, oh, perhaps I'll have to, could you write in the chat the etymology that you were talking about with Lady? Is that what you said at the beginning? Uh, so Kubernetes, the, the helmsman of the ship. It's one of the names for the great, and Margaret will no doubt put all of this in, Margaret Baker. Um, Fantastic, because then I suppose the, the other description of the Virgin Mary would be the star of the sea, which yes. is the thing yes. that's required. And that's, I suppose you could say, that's the, that's the, if you're crossing the seven seas vertically, as it were, yes. to the eighth heaven, which is where she's at the center of the eighth heaven. She's the helmsman with that great long paddle. So you stand at the end back, well, that's the storeman, and you've got this great long, thing which goes right down into the chaos of the sea which enables you to hold the boat steady or to steer you to make sure you don't founder on the rocks so Kubernetes is, is the helmsman is the name for helmsman and that's the name as I understand it of the great name. Well, thanks that, that's really that, that's a great thing to say thanks for that. Thank you very much Caroline I think this is one of the great things also about the wisdom work that it makes connections I mean she is the harmonizer the one who joins together we always find that something I was thinking about, something you were thinking about, they start to connect with each other. So thank you very much, Tom. Um, just in the chat, Janet Lee has just pointed out that the Sutton Who helmet also has the serpent on the third eye and Sutton Who is a ship burial. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Right, can I just ask you, well, I thought this was, um, is various people seem to walk around yeah. You've got your feet all over the one shot. You're okay. We don't have to be outside. I was just going to wake you up at like 11 30 if you want. Sorry, you can just slowly wake up. Well, I can jump on my phone for this. I need you to do homework while we're hooked up. Keep going. There we are. 
So, yes, so the, the shot I worked actually on a project with an Indian Catholic dancer, who, as he beautifully puts it, does a dialogue between Christianity and Hinduism with his own body. He's a, um, he does Bharanatyam dance. I'm rather out of my depth, I've got to admit, but we actually, for the a Nuit Blanche of the Cathedral, it's a great open night, we um, had uh, Pravashan dance on the labyrinth of the cathedral. But on Fridays, people come and they are allowed to walk, they uncover the labyrinth, they're allowed to walk it. Obviously, I think, I mean, Tom has so illuminated us today, the problem is that it's become disconnected from the Christian tradition effectively. I mean, I think, you know, without resistance, we've walked away from it with the loss of Christian cosmology at the end of the Middle Ages. So some of the spiritualities which are brought into it, I think are very questionable and don't adequately distinguish between light and darkness between the angels of God and fallen angels. But for all that, it's a great place of dialogue. And I think the cathedral authorities are doing a grand job. So it was, yes, when I lived in France, it was Fridays. So. Andrew. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen by the whole labyrinth bit, and I hadn't realised, if I had seen it, it hadn't stayed with me, that the French labyrinths are specifically identified as being the labyrinth of Old Beatrice's house. And that, that really struck me because I've seen people use the labyrinth idea and unroll great big rubber but find the labyrinths in churches and dance on them. And I, I got the idea they thought they were making an ascent. Where in, that is, in, in the, those contexts, it's a descent. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the Abingdon labyrinth is definitely an ascent one. So it's probably the context, and it's specifically the Chartres type of labyrinth that seems to have the Minotaur association. But the Abingdon labyrinth um, is an assumption labyrinth, and it's uh, seven circles. And so it's the ascent of, of the Virgin Mary through the seven planetary oh, spheres. Yeah, it's the yeah. assumption. Yeah. 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 I think it, it could be either either because um, you could say that there's two different journeys one one journey which is going down and one journey which is going up and I suppose it's I mean we use these things for contemplation and so I suppose whatever's appropriate Tom thank you ever so much and it's now time